Was there ever a time when you realized, wow, was that a bad decision? Maybe you were sure that HD DVD was going to be the future. Maybe you thought the Zune was sure to overthrow the iPod. Maybe instead of Google, you liked to use <laughs> Okay, couldn't keep a straight face there. Or maybe you were like me, and decided that instead of an iPad or an Android tablet, you had to have a BlackBerry Playbook. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking, what? BlackBerry made a tablet? And yes, they did. This was actually a few years after the release of the iPhone, around the time management had acknowledged that Apple was a threat after falling way behind them, and started the strategy of doing whatever Apple did. The iPhone had a touchscreen, so the BlackBerry Storm had a touchscreen. Apple released the iPad, so naturally, BlackBerry had to release a tablet of its own. And thus we got the Playbook, a 7-inch tablet with a $700 price tag. Needless to say, the Playbook flopped, reaching about a 3% market share compared to Apple's 61% in the tablet market. The price was slashed and more tablets sold, but overall the Playbook never did take off. Enter me, someone who had never owned a tablet and hardly ever used one, but after seeing a friend's Playbook thought it was the coolest device ever. Add in the bargain price compared to the iPad and the playbook seemed like the obvious choice. I hopped aboard the sinking Blackberry ship and bought a 64GB playbook. Now it would be too easy to make fun of the playbook for being a product that was destined to be forgotten, but a lot like the Newton, the playbook is actually a pretty decent device that had a lot of potential, especially considering it was rushed out in about a year. The tablet isn't too bulky, being about a centimeter thick and 9 inches across. In that space though, it hosts a micro USB for charging and connecting with a computer, a turbo charging port for a special dock, and a feature not seen on many tablets, a micro HDMI port to connect to an external display. Across the top, there's a headphone jack and the standard buttons, lock, volume control, and interestingly, a pause button. A handy feature that I can't say I've seen on many other tablets or smartphones. The Playbook has front and back cameras capable of recording up to 1080p, and a little light for notifications. Internally, my Wi-Fi model playbook boasts a 1GHz processor, though the 4G LTE models house a faster 1.5GHz processor. Something unique to the playbook is its huge bezel. It looks a little weird, but the whole thing is actually touch sensitive. It allows for a pretty intuitive gesture-based interface, with swiping that starts from off the screen. This interface was actually what sold me on the playbook. Some elements are still used today, like being able to swipe down from the top to open system settings, but others are kind of unique and handy, like swiping from the corners to bring up the notifications bar, or a keyboard. Of all the gesture features Playbook OS has to offer, my favorite are still the ones used for multitasking simply for how easy they are. Want to switch apps? Just swipe from the left or right to move over an app, or see everything running by swiping up from the bottom. It seems trivial now, but at the time iOS had a basic, and dare I say clunky, task switcher, while the Playbook had this incredibly intuitive multitasking interface. Beyond those gestures, the OS itself runs very smoothly and doesn't have a lot of visual clutter. It does, however, have a pretty nice share of pre-installed apps to make full use of the tablet. Being a BlackBerry product and primarily aimed at the professional crowd, the playbook comes with your standard business organizational programs, an email client, a calendar, and most notably, Docs2Go, an office clone which includes the BlackBerry equivalents of MS Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. It's pretty limited, but for simple things like typing a document or basic spreadsheet manipulation, it works pretty well. The PowerPoint editor, though, is pretty disappointing. More precisely, it's a PowerPoint viewer. About the only editing that can be done is changing the text on a slide. The program can't even create new files, only open ones that are already downloaded to the device. As for media, the included software does a pretty good job, but not much beyond that. It has a nice music player, though honestly, it's kind of hard to mess that up and can play HD video files. YouTube used to work, but thanks to the introduction of a new API, the tablet can't play YouTube videos in its native app or in the included web browser. It takes downloading a more recent web browser from BlackBerry World to be able to watch a YouTube video, and even then, it can't be played in full screen. Probably one of the most attractive aspects of the playbook are the games that are available for it. While there isn't much that's exclusive to the playbook, many of the more popular mobile games, of 2012 at least, have found their way onto the device, like Plants vs. Zombies, Angry Birds, Cut the Rope, and so on. Of all these apps though, there was one that I used far more than any other, the Playbook Basic Interpreter. The app was pretty simple, but its graphical abilities along with the fact that I could use it anywhere meant that I ended up writing a bunch of little programs for it. Now coding may not be what everyone wants to use their tablet for, but on long car trips it was certainly a good way to pass the time. While the playbook does have all of these apps available, there isn't much more that it can offer. 
and this was the most glaring area where the playbook really lagged behind its competition, developer support. After all, who's going to buy a tablet without any apps on it? And who's going to write apps for a tablet with no audience? This more than anything else is what really spelled the end of the BlackBerry playbook. And as time goes by, BlackBerry World hasn't gotten any better. Most traditional apps you would find on Apple and Android devices are nowhere to be found, and in their place are the cheap off-brand versions of them that litter the store. The BlackBerry playbook was a commercial failure, there's no question about that. But it's fair to say that the device at least had potential. From an interface arguably ahead of its time, a smooth user experience, and a handful of useful apps right out of the box. Back in 2012 when I bought it, the playbook was my first experience with an internet-enabled mobile device. And the idea of being able to carry a tiny computer with me wherever I went that could go online, listen to music, and write programs was fascinating. Over time though, the list of things that other devices could do that my playbook didn't support began to grow. And by the time I got my first smartphone, I didn't have much of a need for the playbook anymore. Having recently dug it back out, I will say that it's still a decent device for going online, watching a movie, or listening to music, but beyond that, in my opinion, the playbook just doesn't hold a candle to my Android phone. Currently, it looks like playbooks are approaching dirt cheap levels, with prices as low as $40 in some place. If I were to recommend the playbook, it would only be as a replacement for a netbook or for the media applications I mentioned previously. Otherwise, the better option would just be one of those cheapo Android tablets simply because they can support more for a similar price. It's pretty sad to see how far the BlackBerry playbook has fallen, for me anyways, because of how much usage I was able to get out of mine, but recently it seems to be getting an odd sort of legacy. Probably just because how cheaply they can be bought right now, I couldn't help but notice that playbooks were being used as props in that YouTube movie, The Thinning. Perhaps in the not too distant future, the BlackBerry playbook will make a comeback and become bigger than ever. After all, it already seems to be the tablet of choice for overpopulated dystopias.